each other. Right? If they don't link up with each other very much, then they're not forming uh, a social network over there on the right. And instead, what and so th if you look at social networks today, um, for example, um, Twitter spammers. So when we look at graphs of Twitter spammers, what we see is something like you have you have the key spammers. You have they are connected um, to some dummy nodes. Not a lot. So it's kind of a hub and spoke kind of thing. And then and then you have some attack edges that go to there's sort of two types of people that have been identified. Um, there's people called social butterflies. Basically, whenever you send them an invitation, they'll excuse me, they will basically friend you back no matter who you are. So they're just indiscriminate. And then you have people who are social promoters who actually do the reverse. They go around trying to friend everybody else, hoping to get some reciprocal um, friendships. So in both of these. And these are both automated forms of attack. They're not just. So those latter two are actually people. They're, oh, they're actually. So, so social butterflies are people who are just promiscuous with their friendship relationships. Um, Social promoters are people who usually they have a, a business and they're trying to do some shady marketing and what they're doing is going around, they'll, they'll friend everybody in the room, um, maybe a couple of you will friend them back and then they, you know, and they will friend lots and lots of people the, up to the, probably the Twitter maximum of 2,000 people and then, um, and then they'll get, you know, I don't know what percentage they'll get back um, and then the percentage they get back, they send out some messages and some spam. Here's, hey, check out our newest deal, check out my new website, that kind of thing. So those are two categories of people who end up befriending uh, attackers un, you know, unwittingly. Um, Let me see if I understand that, though. But you would still expect to have the connections from the honest node to the symbols to be low density. Ah, okay, so what I, where I was going with all of that is um, in the Twitter world, the, the attacks don't really look like this. They actually look like a bunch of scattered attackers hanging outside the honest notes, because the attackers aren't usually talking to, each, they aren't connected to each other for the most part. There's a, there is that sort of hub and spoke group but uh, I'm, a lot of the other accounts are just dummies and they don't do anything, except some of them I think do retweets of whatever the spammer is sending out, but they don't have any other connections, followers or followees, so they don't do anything else. Um, I think they're there just there to say that the spammer has already has 47 friends, so he's not a complete lone, lone wolf trying to um, establish an account with you. So, so anyway, that's different. What I'm talking about here, the reason why this is why this model exists is uh, because of the invitation requirement that I was talking about. So, if in order to join the network you need an invitation or you need a social link in the graph to an existing node, then you're going to try to create those, um, and you're going to create some of those and then you're going to backfill the rest of your attack network in order to have as much influence on the entire system as possible. So for spam, it's, that's not a very useful model, but for disrupting a peer-to-peer -peer system, it is. Okay, so with that, I'm going to start talking about the, the two systems that make up the core of the work um, in this area. So one of these is Pisces, the core of our work in this area. So Pisces is joint work primarily, actually it was done by Pratik Mittal, who is uh, postdocing at UC Berkeley, and his advisor Nikita Borisov at Illinois. And so before I get into the details of the system, I need to intro a little bit about anonymity systems. So I mentioned uh, the Tor system, that's an anonymity system, and explain a little bit about how these work. 
So an anonymity system is going to be one in which we have, say, Alice and Bob and Carol on the left, and they want to talk to Google and say whistleblower.com, and we don't know who wants to talk to whom. Um, because those relationships are being hidden by this blender in the middle, uh, which in some systems we could call a mix, so you can think of that. Um, and the idea of the mix is to hide is that everybody sends their traffic to the mix, the mix sends the traffic back out, the, re the responses come back through the mix, um, and so anybody who's watching Alice does not know who Alice is talking to, anybody who's watching whistleblower.com does not know who is blowing the whistle. Now, all right, and we will call the people over on the right the initiators, so the users of the system who want the anonymity, the websites over on the left we'll call the responders. Uh, those are old security protocol terms. Um, so does anyone see the problem with this approach? You can't trust the blender. You have to trust the blender. Okay. And there's only one blender. So the blender sees all. And that's not good. And of course, you could have multiple single blenders like this, but each one sees all of what you're doing. So what we do today is distribute the anonymity over multiple blenders, so multiple of these proxy servers that are taking the traffic in from our Alice's and Bob's and Carol's and passing them along. Um, and we use some encryption to hide the relationship between what we see at the beginning of the path and at the end of the path. And the mix, the blender here on the left can see who you are, can see your identity, your IP address in particular. The blender on the right can see the, who you're talking to and if the traffic is not SSL encrypted, for example, they can see what you're, what you're talking about. But unless the two blenders get together and work out based on, say, some timing information, um, who, which connections match up with which other connections, they're not going to be able to put, say, two, any individual blender is not going to be able to put two and two together because they don't have two. They only have the other two. So in a system like Tor, um, one of the things that you're going to need, so Tor has thousands of Tor servers and hundreds of thousands of Tor users. And each of the Tor users is going to go to what's called a directory server, which is Dave over here on the left. And the first thing they're going to need to do is say, Dave, give me a list of all of the Tor servers. I need to know who all the Tor servers are so I can connect through them in order to, in order to make my way out anonymously to Jane and Bob over on the other side. And Dave says, OK, here's a list, and it's not just a list of IP addresses. It includes uh, some public keys that it's going to do some encryption and some other statistics about the, the uh, bandwidth available and performance and stability of the servers and so on that are needed in order to provide good service to help. And this works fairly well when we have thousands of nodes and hundreds of thousands of users. But we can imagine that there could be more users in a system like Tor. Uh, for example, Skype has 15 million simultaneous connections um, at peak. And while we might um, not necessarily expect quite so many, we certainly could expect Tor to grow into the millions of users, especially if performance were to improve a little bit. One of the things that needs to happen if Tor is going to grow is that you're going to need more servers. So, well, so we have two conditions. We've got uh, one is that there are more users. The other condition is that because there's more users, there need to be more servers. Each time a user comes online, they're going to ask the directory server again, give me information about the list of the, um, the list of Tor nodes. Give me all of the information about all the Tor nodes in the system. Um, and and the directory server is going to send it this big long list of information. And the list has gotten longer, so more users asking for more data, which means that things are going to grow quadratically. Um, 
the green line for reference shows the amount of data that's being sent out of the network. So that is, um, if all of the users weren't making Tor connections, but instead were just surfing the same websites normally, that's how much traffic would be generated. In other words, how much traffic is coming out of the exit nodes, the last nodes in the Tor path. The black line, um, well the black line indicates what is Tor's, what would Tor be like based on Tor from 2009. So things have changed a little bit since 2009. Um, but in 2009 what it looked like was this black line where if the number of simultaneous clients were to grow a little bit past a million, the amount of traffic being used just to download, just for all the users to download the directory service information would actually exceed the amount of bandwidth being used to forward the <coughs> traffic uh, that people were using for the web browsing and BitTorrent and whatever else that they used Tor for. So that's ridiculous. Um, so even if we don't exceed that amount of bandwidth, it's still a ridiculously high amount of bandwidth to get directory service information. If we absolutely minimize the amount of directory service, so that, uh, then we get the blue line. Um, we still get quadratic growth. It's a slower quadratic growth. Um, but even when we're talking about, say, 2 million simultaneous clients, then we get over 1.5 million gigabytes per second hitting the directory server. And that's and a lot. It's sort of a, a like, uh, Theorem that says it has to be that much. Like, is, um, that, so is that an implementation thing, or is that a fundamental thing about how it works, about how any <coughs> anonymizer works that it has to be this way? Great question. So one of the things that you could do is say, um, if I'm the director server, okay, I'm not going to give you the whole list. You come to me. I, I'm not going to give you the whole list. I'm going to give you a partial list. The problem with that is. Then I can, if I'm uh, either a malicious directory server or someone who can see, um, just observe what connections are being made, then I can um, learn something about your patterns over time because I can kind of narrow it down. Well, I know you're not using these exit nodes, you're using this set of exit nodes, and so over time um, gain a little bit of information about about you. Now, that doesn't mean it isn't uh, a more practical idea. Um, you could also use private information retrieval as a way of saying the client is going to ask the server um, for a specific set of nodes and the, using PIR protocols, the server is only going to give it a partial amount of information, but the server doesn't know which pieces of information it gave. So you could do that. Um, that's been proposed, um, and I, you know, the, those are uh, reasonable solutions. But PIR is kind of it, it's a little expensive computationally, so there are trade-offs. Um, we're looking at another, you know, basically another solution to this same problem. Also, even if you have um, even if you solve this problem, there's also the problem of whether you trust the directory server. The way they do it now, they actually have um, a number of independently controlled directory servers who are supposed to go through an agreement protocol about which Tor nodes are currently in the network um, and come up with a consensus and then they do a group signature thing on the consensus. So the client has to do, you know, gets to check the group signature on the consensus file. But you can only distribute that trust out so much. Whereas what we're talking about, what we're going to talk about in a second, we can expand the amount of trust further. And so the way we would do that is by using a structured peer-to-peer -peer system in place of the directory server. So all of the, um, we would basically have all of the users and we imagine a world in which all of the users are providing for service and anonymizing service as well as, um, as well as using the service. And we put them into a structured peer-to-peer -peer system um, so a structured peer-to-peer -peer system is one in which we give all of the nodes an ID, and the ID could be based on, for example, a 
cryptographic hash of their public key. So we assume that they have um, an assigned public key, and then we take the, the hash of that public key, and that places that gives them an identity that places them in the structure. And then everybody owns a chunk of IP space. So what we've shown here is um, we actually have it kind of backwards, but I'll go with it. The the node owns the uh, ID space to its left. So node N1 owned the um, ID space to the left of it. So it has ID 25. So anything to the left of it, and the next node shown is 12. So anything between 12 and um, 13 and 25, uh, it, it owns. And what it means to own it is that if there's a lookup for, say, ID 17, which is in that space, then that lookup should go to node N1. So we have, um, and anything that say between 26 to 28 would instead go to node N2 and so on. And there's a lot of protocols for doing this kind of thing. Um, a couple of them that came out, uh, Salsa was one of ours, and there was AP3 that came out a few years before that. These turn out to be broken. So, um, Pratik Natal, my collaborators, um, and Nikita, they broke this um, using finding some information leak attacks back in 2008. In 2009, um, three different papers came out. Two of those were Torsk and Nissan. These two were, were based on fairly similar principles. Um, as our system and Salsa as well as AP3 and so they were also broken uh, the next year at CCS. And I want to go back a second. So this graph, by the way, does come from the Torsk paper. And one of the things they were able to show in the Torsk paper is that the amount of bandwidth that would be required in order to do this peer-to-peer -peer version is this red line down here. Right? So drastically reduced, especially as the um, number of nodes grows. Something probably greater, it looks like it's probably um, a little bit greater than linear, but still going to scale quite well into the millions of nodes. Okay, and so what was the other, the third protocol? The third protocol introduced in 2009 is Shadow Walker. And Shadow Walker, unlike these other four approaches, is based on the idea of using a secure random walk. And the secure random walk provides nice properties um, that mean that, uh, based on the design of the protocol, that the, the fundamental protocol has not been broken. Right? It's been examined carefully, um, modified a little bit in a, recent, uh, in a a more recent paper, but fundamentally has not been broken. So we believe that this idea of using a secure random walk um, in, well, certainly in a structured peer-to-peer -peer system is one that works well for providing anonymity. In Pisces, what we're going to do, instead of using a structured peer-to-peer -peer system, we're going to use an unstructured uh, topology. And in particular, the topology that we're going to use is a social network. So. And I'll talk about why that's useful uh, in a little bit. But first, um, in order to do this secure random walk, we can't use the same techniques that were used in Shadow Walker. Because in Shadow Walker, what we needed was the structure in the structured peer-to-peer -peer system. That tells us where other nodes are in a routing table relative to its, its own identity. And without that, we can't we can't build um, the same type of secure random walk. In our random walk, we do a couple of different things. So one is we use, we first enforce the security of it by using what's called the reciprocal neighbor policy. This is a simple idea of basically, if you're friends with someone in a social network, they should be friends with you too. And that is something that we can then turn around and verify by using what we call test and ra testing random walks. So we have some additional random walks in the system that are used to test out the, f the fact that 
different people have each other in their routing tables and in fact have not just said that to each other but have signed that for a period of time um, and if you get two periods of time that are the same time but you have different routing tables signed by that node then that means you have a conflict and that node is trying to cheat or it's private key has been exposed, either of which is pretty bad, um, pretty bad for that node. Now the other thing that I should point out here is it might seem a little strange to say, well, we're doing an anonymity system, but you're going to expose to other people your social network information. What we say is, well, you don't have to expose all of your social network information. You don't have to expose all of your social contacts. But you presumably have some social contacts that are more or less public, that um, are, A, you contact with them frequently so that there's no real way to hide them in any anonymity system anyway, at least not with the ones that we've constructed so far. And it's also the case that you probably don't mind if somebody knows uh, your good friend is your friend in this social network. All right, so then why do we want to do a random walk over a social network instead of using a structured peer-to-peer -peer system? And this gets back to this chart that I showed earlier, where you've got the honest nodes on the left and the civil nodes on the right, and you have relatively few attack edges between them. If that's the case, as I mentioned before, the honest nodes, if you start at an honest node, a random walk starting at an honest node, is not very likely to jump over an attack edge, because there's relatively few of them, into the civil network. Okay, So when we build our anonymity paths, what we're going to do is do this random walk through the social network. Um, and we're going to take the first node on the path and say, which is one of your friends, and say, you are the first node in the anonymity path. We're going to take the last node on this random walk path and say you are also, you're the last node in the in the path. And then we take one sort of from the middle of the path, sort of uh, half of the way through and say you are the, th the middle node on the path. Um, and those can be the three nodes. If we want three nodes in the, the anonymity path, those can be the three nodes we choose. So what this does in terms of picking that first node from among your friends is, um, and, and the fact that it's relatively unlikely for you to, for your random walk to jump over into the civil network, is that it's difficult for the attacker to do what's called a route capture attack. So basically, if the first node on the path and the last node on the path are both malicious, then they can use timing information and put together the fact that they are on the same path um, and therefore they know who, you're, who you are and who you're talking to. Okay, so we said that's bad, um, and we want to reduce the chance that that happens. Now you could say, well, if using your friends is good, a good idea for that, then why don't you just put all of your friends on the path? Um, and the reason is basically we want to try to do the best we can to hide where the path comes from. If all you do is ever use your friends, then when you look at the, uh, when someone tries to observe what you're doing over time and they see connections being made and all of the connections come from your friends, then, well, they can kind of figure out that must mean it's from you. Or at least narrow it down to a pretty small list. So to show this um, a little more visually, when we look at a random walk and we look at an initiator and we have you know, I have a toy example of an unstructured network here. Um, and we get one step in the random walk, then the node, if I go back, the node that's made this connection knows that this is um, surely the initiator of the random walk because he saw the message come directly from it. So we certainly want more than one step. If we take a second step, and we'd say, well, two steps ago in the random walk, well, one step ago, we saw the predecessor, so we know which direction this came from, and we look two steps back in the random walk, and it could be one of these two nodes, who's the possible initiators. If we, so that doesn't really provide a lot of anonymity. If we take another step in our random walk, we can see that we've only added really one more possible initiator in our, in our 
uh, three hops ago in a random walk. But one of the things that happens in social networks is that there are a lot of, well, not a lot of, but there are these hub nodes, these nodes that are relatively popular, have a relatively <coughs> large number of friends. In our small network, the node that we're currently sitting at is the hub, really the only hub node. Um, and when we take one step away from the hub node, it turns out that any of these, oops, I think there should be more. Oh, there we go. Um, that any of the purple nodes now, and I think I counted this as nine, um, could, could be a possible initiator four steps. So when we're in a social network, as long as we have a, a block in the social network that is long enough to get us past a hub um, or two, then we're going to get a pretty good amount of anonymity in terms of where could this random walk have come from. So it's a person who's looking to, like, they see this message is now here, mm -hmm. and what they get to observe is how many hops ago it started. They get to observe a hop count for that message, and that's yes. and, and the prior. Do they? And the, and so and the who, assumption. Who they so I received it from. Well, I made the assumption here that that the entire social graph is known to the attacker, um, but I'm. Just giving this as an example. So, would the entire social network be known to the attacker? Not directly, but you could do. So, I mentioned these testing random walks. You could probably do enough testing random walks so that you could observe a pretty large fraction, at least, of the social network and understand kind of the topology of the social network. But in, in analyzing the anonymity, it provides you assume that you give that away. Yes. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. kind of a Yep. So, so then when you give it away, you give away the network and the, the how much anonymity is, oh, a, a message that's four hops old, how many places could it have originated from in this network? Right, so and, and you can work it out more precisely as to, you know, what are, the, what are the probabilities that it showed up from any of these different places? Based on it being randomly rooted mm -hmm. over, okay. Yeah. The scaling factor between the size of the available botnets and the size of the social network seems to be rather large, isn't it? Right, don't botnets come in uh, six figures? Well, it depends. So um, compared to say a hundred for the social network, so yeah, can't you just throw a big hammer at this. How does that scale? Oh, well, so the goal is to make it so that the uh, the real cost to the attacker is the attack edges. So the, the social engineering that's required in order to create new edges in the in the social network. So that's sort of the hammer. Uh, if he can have a hammer that gives him the ability to do that, uh, a lot of that, more than he could otherwise, then that would be a problem for this, all a lot of these approaches. Um, so that's the fundamental assumption. If that doesn't work, scale, then I don't have a sense, but I just got the sense, I got the feeling that the botnets could come pretty large compared to the size of the social network. So do you have the right order of problem there? I'm not sure I asked the question, but it seems like uh, yeah, I know your attacker's got more more dumb recent more minions available than you have friends. But he has to so either he has to successfully get his minions to create new friendships with real people, right? So we assume that that's hard, and if you can't do that, then what's left is he has the topology problem that we showed where he's all, all of him are stuck over there on the right with relatively few edges between you, so random walks that start out in the honest network will tend to stay in the honest network and not jump over to his network. Okay. So no matter how many he has over there, what's really important is the number of edges between the two networks. So let me ask a Yane style question. Have there been studies done where if you have an unknown person ping somebody and ask for a connection, what fraction of the people will accept it? They have. I don't remember the number. It's um, it's a little alarmingly high. But that was my concern. <laughs> so that's why I mentioned the interaction graph. Then you might want to use um, the fact that you only create, you only s establish an edge in the social network if there are um, 
if there are a series of messages that go back and forth between them. Now you could ask the question, and I've thought about this myself, well, the, the attacker, he can create a chat box, right? And maybe convince some, so that hasn't been done because there aren't any systems that you know, require interaction graphs in order to establish anything um, in, in order to establish a meaningful relationship. Um, so I don't know, maybe we'll see some of that research done later or maybe some of those attacks done later if, if a system like this is actually brought to bear. So I, I never tend to underestimate people. As, as a personal story, many years ago, Bed Bath & Beyond sent a wedding gift astray and for the last 20 years, I have been getting Christmas cards from a couple <laughs> somewhere that are in the Navy, fly as a pilot. It was an interesting person. I keep getting these cards. I mean, I think each of them thinks that I, I knew the other one. And I haven't had the heart to tell them that they've been doing this forever. <laughs> <laughs> so since you mentioned me, uh, do, do, would you have a member who had to look at this friending systematically? So, so we have the snapshot of 294 square users which came from Twitter and half of them had friends who they didn't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, so no, it's quite prevalent today and, and so the question would be can you develop, so if you're building a peer-to-peer -peer system, um, can you do it in such a way that that you take that into account? So interaction is harder. Right. right? It's right. A, it adds to the cost of the attacker. I think that that like whether it, it probably decreases the success rate for the attacker, um, and it's uh, because I think, for example, there's a lot of people on Facebook who see these profiles and they know that they're fake. They know that they're not, uh, you know, hot twenty-two year olds who are who are after them and want to make friends with them and so on. The, the, but you know, there's. But why not see if there's extra pictures that her friends can see, right? right? So, um, so in this system, I think the assumption is: well, if if this person starts chatting with you, you, you know, do you actually engage in the chat? Do it more than once. Um, and some people surely will, right? But I think a reduced fraction from the original fraction. Right, right. so I, I did get that idea when I was just interested in the peripheral questions. Do you, I mean, do you know if anybody had compared social networks like, are you more likely on Twitter to have more people you don't know as friends compared to Facebook or LinkedIn? Or so the studies that I know about are ones where they've taken, um, where they've they've done the attack. Okay. So they create the fake profiles of different types, you know, some men, some women, different characteristics, and try them, right, to see if to see who who accepts, right, what percentage of people accept. What are their characteristics and so on? That question is uh, somewhat less relevant uh, if the people actually know that their links will be used for anonymous systems, for building an anonymity system. So, it, it's, so then they'll think more carefully when they accept a friend request, right? So I, I appreciate, I I appreciate the hope. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and I, yeah, I don't know if we're going to get to my second system, but um, in my other system, we, I wouldn't say we rely on it. We do suggest it as a, you know, you should warn the users, please don't accept, you know, friend requests from, from strangers and invitate, don't make invitations to people you don't know. Um, uh, because it will, it will uh, cause security problems in the system. And I think that actually may have some impact, um, the, especially if the nature of the system is not one in which by friending, by inviting me into the system, you now, you know, you now get to see my, my pictures or something, right? It's a less, 
you know, you, if you invite me, maybe you can convince someone. If you invite me into the system, I have tons of um, I have tons of music, right? You should invite me into the system because I have tons of this type of music. That, you know. um, it's unclear what type of social. I expect that that type of social engineering would somewhat be be somewhat less successful, um, but of course we don't know. All right. I don't know if you remember Bob Lucky in, in Spectrum. Bob Lucky got uh, fished. If you can get him to get fished, somebody who's very sophisticated and uh, oh yeah, yeah. It's, um, you it's hard to imagine right that, that this isn't going to be successful. Yes, yes. So uh, the question is just Maybe how much pictures. success and how much and how much work. Right? How much work is it on the part of the attacker? Um, because it's known, for example, in um, so captures. Um, captures are uh, you know there are ways to break them. Um, but it turns out that the that they're still an effective tool because you can either break them automatically using uh, optical character recognition and so on, or you can break them by uh, convincing people to well, for example, fill the you know fill out this captcha when you sign up for um, my my special website that you want to go to. Um, but doing all of this costs the attacker a few cents, I think, per CAPTCHA assault, which doesn't eliminate the problem, but it, it is effective, it is useful. Right? So I, I think that the goal is maybe to make things look kind of like CAPTCHAs do. Make it a little bit harder, increase the cost to the attacker, and then say, you know, is it really worth taking down this system to spend that much effort, money, etc., resources. Weed out the amateurs. Yeah, yeah. And, and even if it's, you know, if I could make a small profit from doing this, that may not be worth it, right? I'd have to make a larger profit from doing this. Okay, so we'll summarize the results in a single graph. I talked about Shadow Walker before. Um, this is on a Facebook <coughs> interaction graph with about 33,000 nodes in it. The number of attack edges goes from zero up to 3,000. So at the far right hand side, you're seeing a little less than one in every 10 people has, has accepted an attack edge. Um, so kind of a lower, a lower level of attack edges. Um, on the y-axis, so you can see, so the y-axis is entropy, which is a measure of energy. And, um, the only thing I will explain here is that this is a logarithmic uh, type of thing. So one bit of entropy represents a doubling. Uh, increasing one bit of entropy represents a doubling in the size of the number of people um, that a message might have come from if you have equal probability among the messages, uh, among, among those people. So, Shadow Walker, you can see, gets beat up pretty bad as we increase the number of attack edges, um, which increases the number of attackers into the structured peer-to-peer -peer network. Whereas Pisces holds up you know, relatively well uh, and has pretty much uh, close to the maximal, uh, you know, two to the number or whatever the number of the log of the number of nodes in the network um, is the amount of entropy that it gets. So it's it's holding up. So, so does this depend on how big the network is? Did you say? Like um, you so if you increase the size of the network, um, both the um, and both of them will will go up, right? Um, because the size of the network affects the amount of entropy that's possible. Um, so is this if these networks are two to the t nodes, basically? Yeah, like thirty-two thousand nodes. Yep. Okay. So now I'm going to switch gears. I think. Um, mm, all right. I'm going to fly through this second system like really, really fast because you've had some excellent questions. Um, so peer-to-peer -peer file sharing. There's millions of users. 
Um, and so we're gonna build one of those. The idea of Persia, the main idea that I wanna get across is that what we're going to try to do is capture the notion that your social network can be used as a sort of identifier for you. So if I was to say, if you were to basically give me um, the, the social network graph with you missing from it, um, if I know a little bit about your friends, then I can probably go, wait, there's a hole here, and this is where you should be, and here's at least some of the connections that should, should definitely be there. Um, and then with enough basically external information, you kind of put it together that the, that, that serves as a sort of identifier for a person. Where you are in the social network is a pretty good proxy for your identity. But we're gonna try and capture that notion and actually build it directly into the system. Um, skipping, okay. Um, and we do that using a bootstrap tree. So, is there a question? Oh, okay. So, um, a bootstrap tree is basically an invitation tree. It says, here's the people who started the network at the top, and then underneath them are the other people who joined through them, and so we're gonna create a whole tree. We're gonna use that to allocate the ID space. As I'm short on time, I won't really explain too carefully because it is a little bit complicated. Um, the whole notion of how the IDs are, are allocated and so on. Um, but it looks, you can kind of get a sense, it looks something like this where we had two nodes at the start that started off the network and they broke off chunks of ID space for their friends who wanted to join the network through them. And then those nodes broke off more ID space for the nodes who wanted to join through them. And it gets progressively, the chunks of ID space get smaller as we go along. The value of this is now suppose that an attacker joins the network. He's going to get a chunk of ID space. And at that point, once he's, um, as we talked about before, once you're in the system, you can invite as many other attackers as you want, but they all have to be inside of your chunk of the ID space, which is going to be relatively limited compared to the entire size of the ID space. Of course, you can try to get um, as the attackers want to do, he's going to get more than just one invitation, he's going to get a bunch of invitations, which are the number of attack edges. Um, and so he's gonna get little chunks of ID space all around the network. Um, but what, he's, what we're going to be able to avoid is him controlling, for example, a large chunk of ID space um, or controlling a large fraction of the network as a whole in terms of the ID space that's owned for the purposes of lookup. Then we build on top of that some redundant lookup, um, which I'll just try to get to the intuition um, here at the end. When we have our querying node making some redundant lookups to IDs that are evenly spaced around the circle, those that are in the attacker's part of the circle will obviously fail. And I've showed kind of a bad case example where the attacker owns a big chunk of ID space. Um, the some other lookups may fail because they require some of the attacker nodes in order to get there, but as long as one of our lookups succeeds, we're going to get the information we want. So that's kind of the really quick and dirty explanation. Does the distribution of uh, IDs matter? Um, so we start off assuming that, you know, at the beginning we have a set of bootstrap nodes who are honest, uh, they start off honest, they don't have to stay honest forever. Um, and they start giving out chunks of ID space to their friends and it goes down. Now if we have, in our experiments, we do find that we get you know, uneven allocations of ID space. So the results that I'm gonna show you in a second, we have the uneven distribution of ID space. Um, we still get decent results. Um, the we're trying to deal with the uneven distribution of ID space a little bit because um, it uneven ID, ID distribution means that the, the amount of work will be heavier for some nodes than others. So we want to try to alleviate that, but the security of the thing still works pretty well. I was sort of asking the other question, is there a distribution of ID space that actually can be used to, to attack the system? to minimize its efficacy. 
I don't. Some kind of long tail distribution or something that was a way of uh, penetrating into there easier. Well, certainly. So if the attacker can, um, the attacker certainly would try to do this. Um, you would try to make friends with uh, nodes that are highest up in the bootstrap tree first right, and work his way down. Um, the, we allow the attacker to make connections to any nodes throughout the tree randomly. Um, so he might try to do better by, by somehow targeting the ones at the top. But we don't, we don't stop him from doing that, but we don't give him any special advantages in being able to trick the nodes at the top. So that's kind of what we do. Um, other than that, I don't think there's anything like technical that he can do. I think that's the social engineering component is the, the key. OK, so I'll skip things and go straight to results. Um, in the x-axis here, we have the ratio of attack edges to nodes. So the attack edges G to nodes N, honest nodes in the system. Um, now, when we were talking before, systems like Pisces were evaluated to about uh, 0.1 or so. Um, some of the state of the art in terms of developing systems like this um, Farnow and Xvine, I know that says Wano, but it's actually pronounced Farnow, go up to only evaluate up to about 0.15 G over N, and they show results that are somewhere in between the best networks that we have and the worst networks that we have. So um, in our best case scenario, we do better than them, but we do about the same of them on sort of the average case. They only use sort of one network for their evaluations. Um, and I'll skip the clustering thing. Okay, so in conclusion, um, we've seen other ways that social networks can be used to help be defeat um, and defend against civil attacks. And we've presented in this work two different systems that use social networks and embed them into the structure of the network in order to try to prevent uh, these attacks. So one of those was Pisces, where we try to where we provide improved anonymity over the state of the art in terms of these peer-to-peer -peer anonymity systems by using this technique. And in Persia, we have created this idea where the social network is sort of the, the core of your identity, and that's what leads to, um, and that would, that's what leads to improved results against uh, civil attacks. So, any other questions? Thank you, speaker.